Uh, hello, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here, and um, it's great to, to follow up. Um, Nick, um, didn't, I, I don't have to talk about the benefits of the blockchain and all that, so thank you, Nick, for a really great, um, basically, laying the foundation for what I'm going to be talking about. So I'm talking about uh, blockchain and big data and uh, a very specific application of Bitcoin, but not just Bitcoin, um, a whole bunch of other technology too, machine learning, big data, all this sort of fun stuff. And how does this work? Let's see here. That was almost too easy, thank you. All right, so I'm a huge nerd. Um, I love robots. Um, maybe this is embarrassing, but uh, probably about once every two weeks, I go to Google Image Search, and I type in the word robot, or fuzzy robot, or monster robot, and I see whatever weird robots have appeared. And uh, so here's an example of a bunch of robots. Quite often, I put these robot pictures into slides. But I really do care about attribution and creators getting compensated. Um, and so I filter down to just the ones that are available because I think it's really you know, sad when um, images get stolen, um, and that means the creator doesn't get paid. So if I filter down to just the images that are available, there's just one of these uh, 30 or so images that are on this first set of results. There's just one very sad robot from the fi a 1950s toy, basically, right? Which is kind of too bad, right? All the cool ones aren't there. And uh, so I wanted to use a cool one. I can't. And you know, I could right-click and copy any one of these. Uh, I can't right-click and license. I can't give $1 or $5. That's really kind of a shame. Or let's say that I'm a digital artist, right? This work here is by uh, an artist named Jonathan Monahan, based out of New York. And uh, it's video art. And when he goes to sell his works, um, he would try to sell them. And people would say, hey, you know, this is really cool. I, um, but how do I know that you're actually the owner, actually the creator? How do I know you didn't download this from the torrents? Uh, how do I know you own it, right? Because that's the thing about digital, right? Um, everything can be copied, 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 and that's a wonderful property of digital. But it's actually a problem if you're trying to create digital art. Or, many of you guys have probably seen this, uh, I, I'm Canadian, eh? And uh, I moved to Germany about two and a half years ago, and it's actually really hard to, get new, to watch new release movies in English. Uh, you can't go to iTunes unless you have a VPN, which is pseudo-legal. Um, you can do it off the torrents, but if you do that, you'll get a bill for 1,500 euros by, by some record, uh, sorry, some music company, I mean, video company. Um, so I get this all the time on YouTube or on other places. I'm either watching in German, and my German is unfortunately very bad, or I'm, I'm seeing this. And this is basically because there's very, very high friction between the content providers and the channels to consumers on the internet and other um, places that can be consumed. Or let's think about 3D printing, right? So Shapeways, it's a, one of the biggest 3D marketplaces out there. Um, many people, many creators are very hesitant to put content onto Shapeways because as they know that as soon as they put it there um, onto the internet in general, it's out there and they lose control. And this isn't just about 3D um, designs onto Shapeways. This is uh, more broadly speaking, right? People don't have visibility into what they put out there. They lose that, um, the sort of control over it, even if they have the IP rights. So to summarize, there's basically the idea of ownership on the internet uh, and digital property more broadly, it's kind of a mess, right? For creators, for collectors, and for connectors. For creators, how do you get paid for what you create? And if you share stuff on the internet, you lose control. So you know, if you just wrote, spent the last year or five years writing your you know, um, great American novel, you put it out there, um, it get, gets copied, you know, how do you feed your family? Um, or for the collectors or the audiences, there's the not available here problem. Um, I really want the content, I'm happy to pay for the content, but it's just not um, possible to do it in a legal fashion. And um, there's a nice analogy I like to think about this, and that is, imagine you go to a supermarket, and you, you go in and you want to buy an apple, so you pick up at the apple, you go to the checkout, there's no checkout. So you're like, hmm, that's funny. So you kind of walk out the door with the apple and like hoping like, hmm, I wonder, like I'm really hungry. But then this 300 pound security guard comes along and tackles you and says, that's $1,500, please. So that's actually how the internet works right now for IP. Um, so, and then the third thing is connectors. So um, if you want to set up a, a channel for connecting creators with audiences, 
um, you have two options. One of them is to go through a licensing process, and it could take six months or a year, and you probably have to give up a big chunk of your company. That's what Spotify and Deezer did, for example. It took a long time. They had to know the right people. Or you can ignore it and hope it goes away, and that's unfortunately what SoundCloud did for many years. And it's really too bad because they have a wonderful user experience, and they're feeling the pain of not sorting out the licenses fully um, in the early, early days. So um, there's all these problems on the internet for all the different players in the ecosystem, creators, collectors, and connectors. And you can basically throw a rock and you'll see a problem in digital art, in photography, 3D, music, videos, all of this. And it, because it's basically you know, our modern uh, um, technology with digital um, copies and all of this hasn't reconciled well with IP and the laws around that. You can summarize it in the following, following way. Where's my stuff? The where's part is you as a creator or as an owner of content have no visibility into what's going on. And the my stuff part comes down to painful legals, right? It's just really painful to license. So let's just ask, you know, why is this? Um, so let's look into the history of the World Wide Web. In 1989, in March of 1989, a researcher named Tim Berners-Lee went to his boss um, and said, hey, you know, I've got this cool idea for this project. It's hypertext, all this. And people had been talking about hypertext for decades, but it never really rolled out fully, fully, fully. And his boss, um, this was at CERN in Switzerland, he, his boss said, hey, yeah, that's kind of a cool idea. Go on, Tim. Have some fun. Play around. OK. A year and a half later, Christmas 1990, um, Tim Berners-Lee released the World Wide Web. And it included all the components you need to have the World Wide Web, which is basically the first easy to way to explore the internet itself. So there was the world's first browser, the world's first server. There was um, all the communication protocol in between that, um, and all, basically all the technology needed to get going with the World Wide Web. What happened? It took off like crazy. So this was in you know 1990. Um, within a few years, there was better, better browsers. You know, mid-90s um, was the start of the dot-com boom, and it's basically revolutionized all of society. There's hundreds of billions or trillions of web pages, depending how you count it. So the World Wide Web has been a fantastic success. And it's pretty cool. It's a very simple technology under the core. At the core of it, there's basically one thing, simple, stupid, mindless hyperlinks. And that was enough to build a really powerful um, World Wide Web. But it's got problems. So here are some problems. Imagine I draw this amazing robot like you see here, because you know, I love robots. Um, there's a few problems. One of them is people can copy you, uh, your stuff and not give attribution, and I have no visibility. Or people can um, attribute me, but I still won't know um, what's been going on there. Or even worse, they could misattribute to someone else. So they could say, hey, this guy created it. So these are all these different problems, and we see this problem every day, every day, not just with images, um, but with uh, 3D designs, et cetera, et cetera. So once again, we've got this problem. Where's my stuff? No visibility, painful legals. That's the state of the World Wide Web. Well, we might ask, does it need to be this way? Let's look at some pre-World Wide Web history. Going back to the original hypertext project called Xanadu, Ted Nelson was the inventor of the visionary here from 1965, 50 years ago. Consider a unified service that would provide storage and, and publication services and manage royalty payments on a fair basis that would facilitate unrestricted virtual republishing. So this is pretty cool. It's actually handling all the IP out of the box. And this project was called Xanadu. And basically, this is the, the core idea in Xanadu. You had bidirectional links. And what that means is you have attribution built in. So every time that someone uses your stuff, um, you're, um, you're pointing to them as well. And it baked in copyright. And the benefits of these, then, is the following. The, the where's part for where's my stuff, you've got the visibility, because it's two-way links. And the my stuff part, it actually has copyright out of the box. So people didn't have to think about it. When they made a copy um, on their own pay web page, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, it was just there. So very straightforward, a win-win for everyone involved. Well, you might ask, what happened to this? So after this visionary idea in the mid-60s, um, Ted Nelson started to build mock-ups. And it, by the early 70s, they, they had some, some technology, but it turned out it was pretty complicated technology. Uh, in the 80s, they started a company. It eventually got bought by Autodesk, and, but it was still not really fully live, not really fully live. And so um, come along 1989, 1990, when the World Wide Web was released, a much, much simpler technology, and it just took off. And it left the Xanadu project in the dust. Um, the Xanadu project itself actually got shut down in the early 90s, and um, what we were left with is the World Wide Web, warts and all, right? Um, and in fact, Ted Nelson has this amazing quote, HTML is precisely what we were trying to prevent, 
ever-breaking links, no rights management. And the problem is, that's where we are today, right? Ownership of digital property, especially on the net, is a mess, despite being anticipated since the 60s and designed for. But the simplicity of the World Wide Web won out. And you know, many of you are software engineers, we can appreciate that, right? But it left this core problem of where's my stuff unsolved. We've been asking a question in a scribe. Can we retrofit the internet for ownership and realize the Xanadu aims in the process? Not the Xanadu designs, but the Xanadu aims. So the core idea is the following. We automatically discover bidirectional links. So we get bidirectional links, but we don't force it into the protocol. And we make legals, copyright, easy and secure. So I'm going to talk about each of these aspects. The first aspect of the where's part with the auto bidirectional links is the following. And in fact, maybe leading up to this, um, I should give a bit of my background. I spent the last 15 years in the world of AI for designing computer chips, dealing with tens of billions, hundreds of billions of data points daily, uh, where you have a laptop that has to process those in five minutes. And so uh, myself and many people on our team have a lot of experience with big data and machine learning at scale um, over decades. So um, when we looked at this problem of, hey, you know, um, how do we, uh, crawling the web and so on, it turns out it's actually not that big in comparison to some of the problems we've dealt with in the world of semiconductor and otherwise. So the internet itself, um, if you say, I'm going to um, have a very particular um, set of web pages, all of the ones that are less than one megabyte in size in text, um, that's only 220 terabytes of text. It's actually not that big by today's standards, right? Um, so we, we crawl the web, we identify all the links um, to images, to 3D designs, and then we similarity match against that. And we uh, similarity match such that it's not just an exact um, signature bit by bit, but it could be something that's similar, similar in a machine learning sense, in a, a distance measure sense. So this is a machine learning problem at internet scale. Um, and this is what we do. And ultimately, the benefit is that's how you know uh, when someone is using your work. So to give you guys a feel of what this looks like, so, you know, um, I, I, I live in the Bitcoin world and the Dogecoin world, and we all love Doge. And Doge was actually a meme even before um, Dogecoin. And you might ask, OK, so let's say you're the creator of Doge. It's actually a, um, a Japanese kindergarten child in 2010. Um, but you might ask, where is Doge? This is where. If you actually, this is technology that we built in Ascribe. Um, so there's a, a website called sc2tv.ru. It's got 1,200 copies of Doge inside it. TechPowerUp.com has the next highest number, and, and more and more. So there's uh, other sites as well. Um, if you drill down into sctv.ru, you'll see that there's different subdirectories that have different parts. The content subdirectory has the most, taxonomy, users, and several others. You might also ask, how did Doge spread? What is the story of this image? What is the story of this creation? What sparked it? So, well, in October of 2014, there were zero copies, uh, or virtually zero, just one or two. And then what happened was techpowerup.com tech took it in um, April of 2014, and uh, um, the 400, poppies pop 400 copies popped up almost immediately. And then um, this sc2tv.ru, that happened in the last year. And so that's where most of the copies of this particular Doge dog show up. And finally, now we're at about 2,200 copies of this particular Doge dog um, all around the internet. Now, this is a pretty cool thing, right? If I'm a creator, if I'm a creator, I know where this is showing up. Before the solution to this was saying, let's encrypt, let's lock it up, let's put it under lock and key. This is the new deal. DRM has largely failed. The new deal here is you get the visibility into where your work is. Um, a more recent one, we were playing around this with this just the last couple of days, you know, um, the sad incident last week in Paris. You might ask, what about that one, this particular image, which ha has already become iconic? So um, basically, there's uh, about 1,500 copies of, of that image, this particular one, floating around the internet now. And interestingly, um, the largest set of copies are on Twitter. So that already says a lot. Um, this was shared a lot on Twitter more than anything. And if you go inside Twitter, um, the largest, largest, um, place that it was used was the hashtag subdomain. And if you look into that, it turns out there's about 25 different hashtags that people used to share this picture. So this sort of thing actually has tons of uses, and this was just something that was very resonated a lot with us um, with all the um, incident in the last week. 
So that answered the where's part of where's my stuff. But what about the my stuff part? And there's two parts. There's easy legals and there's secure legals. So easy legals, if you think about it, um, if I'm a, a digital artist and I want to sell my work, you can either you know, sell um, the physical DVD to a collector, and you're basically giving, giving them a piece of plastic. And we've actually seen collectors pay $30,000 for a piece of plastic. They're not actually getting the IP rights. They're only getting that piece of plastic. And we actually, when we bring that up to them, some of them come near tears. It's actually kind of too bad, right? Uh, what they really need is to actually get the license, the IP license, to use that, um, that work in various ways to make copies and so on. Uh, however, if you pay a lawyer to do the contract to sell this work, it costs between $500 and $2,000. So that's just simply not in the cards. But what if instead, and actually to riff on what Nick was saying, what if instead you could wire IP as simple as sending an email, just like Bitcoin has made it easy to wire money as simple as sending an email? What about IP itself? This is what we've enabled. So you can actually send IP from one person to the next as simple as sending an email. How? Under the hood, it's actually using existing copyright laws and contract laws um, inside the terms of service, et cetera, where there are contracts built in for saying, I claim copyright on this work, and I transfer a particular set of rights from myself to someone else for this work. And also, provenance emerges, all these sorts of great properties. So that's the easy legals. This is really copyright in a box. But there's a, a problem. Imagine if we just had our own centralized SQL database storing this. Well, you know, if I'm an artist using the Ascribe service, do I really own it? Uh, because it, you really need this to be publicly displayed out there for the world. You know, what if Ascribe became super corrupt or something? Um, you know, you don't want this. You want it as uh, a database for the whole world to view. So that begs the question, of course, um, what about blockchain, right? And it's funny, Nick used the word spreadsheet in the sky, which I thought was really great, because I love to use that phrase too. Um, it's a spreadsheet in the sky. It's also simply a database from the view of um, a scribe anyway. And it's just a very weird database. Anyone can add to it. It gets auto-synced. Nothing can be deleted, and it's fully public. And actually, by the way, um, by most traditional database standards, it's really terrible. Um, the throughput is really horrible. The capacity is really horrible. And you know what? For now, that's OK. Um, that's going to get resolved. It's going to get better. Um, and by the way, the Bitcoin blockchain, Bitcoin database, you can buy and sell uh, e-money, right? So that's that particular token of value there. But overall, um, we like to view blockchain as this very particular type of database. It's you know, a, a database that went blue ocean in this very particular way. So on the My Stuff part, you can have secure legal, secure copyright by timestamping evidence of these ownership actions, these contracts, onto this trusted ledger. The Bitcoin blockchain. So it's via a special protocol, an ownership protocol, um, with things like unique additions, consignment, loans, all this sort of stuff. And timestamping is evidence for the court in case there's ever an ownership dispute. Simple as that. So of course, also, um, there's things like certificates of authenticity. And this is very important for a lot of people in the art world. Um, it's actually a huge problem of fraud in the art world. It's 40 to 50% fraud in the big auction houses, and that's the, the COAs themselves are actually copied all the time. They're very fraudulent. The, the cool thing is they don't need to be fraudulent. If you make a crypto, it means that the statement of um, information that's on there can be digitally signed by a very particular person, and it's all good. And it can also point to online services that actually say who the current owner is. So um, things like uh, fraud actually can get largely minimized because you have things like certificates of authenticity that help to connect to the real world. Um, to give you some examples of how um, a scribe and IP is being used, Jonathan Monaghan, who I mentioned earlier, he's selling his work for $10,000 a pop at Bitforms New York. It's one of the top digital art galleries in the world. Um, three editions, so unique editions. And uh, this is um, one of the editions here. So it's actually a video, but it gives you kind of a feel. But it doesn't end at art. So we've been working a lot with Creative Commons, uh, Creative Commons France, uh, and even Creative Commons Global now, actually. And um, so if you go to cc.ascribe.io, it's actually linked from the Creative Commons France uh, site as well. You can register your work, specify a Creative Commons license, one of their six licenses, and it all gets ascribed to the blockchain. So you not only specify a license, you're actually securing your attribution. Um, there's art museums that are using, starting to use Ascribe and using it. So Mac Vienna um, was the very first. In the spring, they actually did it. And I like this one because they're actually older than Canada. So um, they've, they've, they've been collecting digital art, and they have their own digital art wallet, their own digital art collection. Um, and that's pretty cool. 
Uh, TV stations, this is an interesting one. If you're a TV station, if you're a comic book company, all of this, there are people who contribute work to the TV station as creators. In the case of Icono TV, um, their creators actually register their content via Scribe, and then they license it to Icono TV as simple as sending an email. It's about a three-minute flow to do so. So, um, and Icono TV has hundreds of millions of, of eyeballs that they see, hundreds of thousands of application users, et cetera. So to summarize um, the benefits here um, with, the, with respect to the shape of the internet, it's been poorly shaped for IP, but there's now a solution. And the solution to the problem of where's my stuff is by answering where's through visibility, through internet scale machine learning, and through easy and secure legals, thanks to copyright in a box and blockchain. So a summary here is that big data and blockchains are key to building an ownership layer for the internet. And one small side thing, um, the current blockchain, it doesn't scale yet, but that's coming too. So I'm very excited about that. Um, and that concludes. Thank you.